The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the heritage and places of worship damaged and destroyed in Gaza. A major survey of the indigenous Australian artist Emily Kama Mware and the Gauguin manuscript bought by the Courtauld in London. I talked to Savi Gerampaya, a correspondent for the art newspaper in the Middle East, about the fate of historic buildings and heritage sites following the Israeli bombardment of the Gaza Strip. As a huge exhibition of the work of Emily Kama and Ware, perhaps the most celebrated of all Indigenous Australian artists, opens at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, I talked to the show's curators, Kelly Cole and Hetty Perkins, about her life and work. And this episode's Work of the Week is a manuscript written by Paul Gauguin, just months before he died in French Polynesia. There are some festive offers at theartnewspaper.com with subscriptions starting at just £50 or $62 for one year. Visit theartnewspaper.com slash subscription dash offers. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With. The latest episode features a conversation with the British artist Stephen Willits. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, the human cost of the Israel-Hamas war is staggering. On the 7th of October, the militant group Hamas killed around 1,200 people in Israel and took around 240 hostages. At the time of recording, more than 14,500 Palestinians, including 4,600 children, had been killed in Israeli military strikes, according to the health ministry in Hamas-controlled Gaza. Since a temporary ceasefire began on the 24th of November, a total of 85 hostages have been freed by Hamas and 150 Palestinians have been released from Israeli prisons. Discussions around art and culture can feel obsolete in the face of such tragedy, but in these situations our remit at the art newspaper is to focus on the impact of armed conflict on art, museums, archaeological and historical sites, religious buildings and heritage. And as Blue Shield, the organisation formed to protect the world's cultural and natural heritage, stated last month, protecting people and protecting their cultural heritage are indelibly intertwined. It added that heritage gives people and communities a sense of place, belonging and identity, a reason for living that supports well-being and dignity. And of course, cultural property protection during armed conflict is an obligation under international humanitarian law. News is beginning to emerge of the scale of the destruction of historic buildings and sites in Israel's seven-week bombardment of Gaza. A preliminary report released by Heritage for Peace, a Spain-based NGO focused on safeguarding cultural heritage on the 7th of November, lists more than 100 sites as damaged or completely destroyed. They include historic religious and archaeological sites and museums. Savi Garampaya is a reporter for the art newspaper focusing on the Middle East, and she's been following up on the report and attempting to verify the extent of damage to cultural property. I spoke to her about what she found out. Salvi, you've been following up on this report by this Spanish NGO. What can you tell us? I spoke to the president, Esper Sabrin. The report, it wasn't planned as he put it to me. He basically was following up, like you said, the humanitarian part. It's not something you can ignore. Mm. And he was interested in his contacts. He wanted to make sure they were okay and he was following up with them. And um, through conversations, this really need, I think the way he put it to me, from those contacts on the ground who were really eager to try and find out what was going on with their own heritage. These were people who were involved in heritage sites, looking after heritage sites, let's say recording heritage sites in Gaza. And through conversations, they decided to record or try and document what was going on, what was okay, what wasn't. And it was put together, as he put it, in very difficult conditions. He was out of touch with his contacts for days at a time, trying to figure out if they were okay, they're not okay. And it's a very difficult position to be in. You have people, this is people you're talking about. If they're not getting in touch with you and you're seeing the images on TV, you don't know if they're dead or alive. And they're out trying to figure out, A, if their own loved ones are okay, and then if, what's the status of the heritage sites. But they managed to get what they could together, and it seems to show that there's over 100 sites that have been affected by this recent conflict in Gaza. Now, that number may have changed since the report came out. I was going to say, it was in early November the report mm, came yes, out, so yes. one would expect that certainly more heritage sites have been damaged in, yes, in that period. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, and they've broken down the report into various sections from religious sites to museums to... There's a lot of historic homes that are recorded in Gaza and it, it tries to break those down into those categories. Right. So it's important to stress, isn't it, that Gaza's heritage is enormously diverse and extremely rich. So there is ancient heritage. Numerous peoples have made it their home and have left lasting impact on that landscape and, and those places. Yes, absolutely. It shouldn't be mind-blowing given its location in mm. the Levant. But uh, yeah, I mean, the earliest history, I think, that it's recorded is about three and a half to 4,000 BC, which is where they think they're I think that's the earliest evidence of humans in that area, of people living in that area. And the Egyptians then came around 15 BC, and it goes on and on from the Romans to the Byzantines to Ottomans. It, there's a lot of history in that area. And also important to stress is that actually archaeology is both on the one hand underway, but also extremely difficult. And also there is a lot more to be done in terms of archaeology. As ever with any heavily populated area, buildings have been built on archaeological sites right across the territory. Yes. So it's a really tricky one because there have been some archaeology projects. Most of them stopped in the early 2000s and pretty much completely stopped in 2007 after Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip. Now, in recent years, say 2018, maybe a little bit before that, some projects did pop up, like the French had some projects. The British Council were involved in some of those projects, 2018 onwards, important projects. But archaeology projects in the Gaza Strip are incredibly difficult to carry out, especially since the early 2000s. And come 2007, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, Israel, citing security concerns, blockaded its territory from Gaza. And in the south, Egypt did the same thing. So anything entering the Gaza Strip goes through heavy scrutiny, let's say. So for archaeology projects to be carried out, you need permission from the Israeli government to get that material into the Gaza Strip, which can be challenging. They can have their own challenges. Now, there are other difficulties in the Gaza Strip. The economy is one of the main challenges. There is no money. So archaeology projects have to be 100% funded by foreign entities. And as you can imagine, that in itself has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. So the British Council, for example, at Aleph, that's another organisation that have had some projects there, like the Byzantine Church, like the St. Hilarion Monastery, they had some success in trying to do some conservation work, some restoration works on these sites. But unfortunately, these sites, which are 5th century, go back to 5th century, are also on the list of sites that have been damaged. Right. The extent uh, is under debate of how much damage has been caused, but there's no doubt that there is damage caused to these really important sites. You've been following up on it, right? So Heritage for Peace have given a certain amount of information and you've been trying to get more. I mean, inevitably, as you point out, you know, because human life is so precarious in Gaza at the moment, it's difficult, I'm sure, to get hold of anybody to try and verify information, isn't it? It's very difficult, absolutely. I mean, there was time where internet access was far more challenging than it is now. And you're messaging them, you're trying to get hold of them, they don't answer then you're trying to explain who you are and what the information that you're trying to find out without mm. being insensitive, like you say, the mm, human life. And I'm calling to ask about buildings and sites and, you know, trying to be as sensitive as I can be. And the little internet time they had, they were obviously trying to get hold of their own families, whether elsewhere in Palestine or outside, or if they were, let's say, media collaborators, they're trying to use that internet to get what news they want to get out. So that was very challenging. I did try and go through that list and pick out, because it's 104 sites, there's a lot of mm, sites of on there. The main one, I don't want to say main ones, because every site is important and every site has its own value. But let's say the better known ones and it's through various contacts verify and media reports actually as well. Mm -hmm. I did manage to speak to the Ministry of Tourism Antiquities and they were able to confirm some of the sites. They themselves were unable to ask their own colleagues in the Gaza Strip for obvious reasons. They're like look we're, when we speak to them all we can do is ask about their families are they safe you know they're trying to survive they're trying to just stay alive 
So they couldn't bring themselves to ask, listen, is this site standing or not? But what they did share, they are trying to the best of their ability to record what's going on and follow up on what is going on through very difficult circumstances. They're following up, for example, media reports. So there might be a media report, there's a video or there's an interview somewhere with of his site that's been destroyed, of a, let's say, a residential building that's been bombed. And they are looking in the background because they know where this area is and they're looking in the background to see, because they know, let's say, a mosque was there, and identifying in the background the sites and talking to other people on the ground and other people who have interests, send them information and go, look, I was just here. And they shared a lot of those messages with me. And on top of that, there were people that I did manage to get hold of who had moved from where they were to other areas that were a little bit safer. They were all very clear to say, look, there is no place safe in Gaza. And one of them was the owner of Al Qarara Cultural Museum, which was a little, let's say, community museum. This man had uh, spent his own time and money, with some help from the community, collecting artifacts from the various periods, including Roman Byzantine periods. And his museum was damaged as part of the strikes. Now, it wasn't a direct hit. It was, as he explained, the building next to his was hit. But if you imagine a bomb yeah. next door, the damage it can cause. And some of those pieces were damaged, but he wasn't able to go there himself to see exactly what is left. And he worried for what was left. He was like, this war is not over. Right. So what else can happen? Exactly. You looked into places of worship, and you mentioned a mosque there and people looking at images and trying to identify what's happening to the religious buildings around them. There is a particular mosque in the Jabalia area that you looked at and it seems that that has been rather heavily damaged. Yes. So the Jabalia mosque is said to be completely destroyed. There's videos of it that I've seen online that show the aftermath of the bombing. And this mosque was actually hit not too long after the famous Greek Orthodox Church that was significantly damaged in, in the strikes. So it happened on the same day. It has 7th century origins, this particular mosque. But it's worth noting that it was also bombed in 2014 and it was rebuilt. Right. Now, it's in Jabalia. Jabalia has been under heavy bombing, including there was bombardments of the refugee camp and a UN-run school. So these are the images that we saw on TV when the refugee camp was hit. So you can imagine if you saw the devastation that was caused at the refugee camp. And this is a very heavily populated area. It's very dense. So you can imagine even if the mosque hadn't been hit, which we are told it was, the damage that has been caused in that entire area it would be quite significant. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's more recent reports that there is another mosque, Omari Mosque, which is the largest mosque in the Gaza Strip. Now we're receiving reports that's been damaged. It's significant because when you look at the history of the Gaza Strip, what you have to remember is that, yes, this is a mosque which is historic in itself. It's 7th century origins, as is this other mosque in Gaza, the Omari Mosque. They share the same name, but they're in two different neighbourhoods. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what they were, so you go back and it was a church at one point in the 5th century also, because that was the time that or this area, let's say, mm. when the pagan temples were knocked down and these churches were built and then after that they were converted into mosques. And so you can actually go back and take them back even further to pagan temples. Yeah, it's, they're quite significant historic sites, these religious sites. Absolutely. I remember reading a few years back that there was this ancient graveyard found in Gaza. I remember a report in The Guardian about it. But that itself has been hit, hasn't it? So this is a 2,000-year-old cemetery, and that too has been damaged. What do you know about that? So, yeah, it's a 2,000-year-old Roman cemetery. More recently, I think they were building a housing development there, and they found two lead tombs there, which signifies that they were noble Romans, because that's what they used for the noble Romans. Not just living there, they're buried there. So mm -hmm. that sort of gives you a sense of how important this area was to the Romans. And they found these tombs there. Now, what the Ministry of Tourism Antiquities told me was that 
what they had done was they moved one of these tombs to the storage site along with some of the artifacts that they had found. The storage site was in Gaza City and they don't know if it's been bombed or if it hasn't been bombed. Mm -hmm. The other tomb was actually left on site. They tried to move it. We didn't go into details of the difficulties they faced, but there were some challenges in moving this tomb. Mm -hmm. So it was still there. And the initial reports or the reports that we have are that this site is significantly damaged. It's unclear what, if anything, is left of this site. Right. There was one particularly affecting bit that is in your report, which relates to this project called the Gaza Map. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the Gaza map, that's one of the more recent projects that was happening in the Gaza Strip. It stands for Gaza Maritime Archaeology Project, part of the Maritime Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa, or Maria as they call it. It's run by the University of Southampton and Ulster University, um, and it's a partnership with Oxford University. Mm -hmm. And they started to look at the maritime archaeology in the Gaza Strip, which is a very significant part of the Gaza history. So I spoke to the project's director, Georgia Andrew, and she was so moved by her collaborators on the project who were basically the archaeology students in Gaza. So these students, because they had to do the project remotely, carried out a survey of the area, which ended up mapping out the coastline of the area during the Iron Age, so you're talking about 1200 BC to about 500 BC. And the reason this project is so important is because there is massive erosion in this area on that coast, and they are basically losing about a metre of coast, is what I was told, every year. That's huge when you're talking about archaeology. So a lot of this archaeology is being lost. There is quite a bit underwater, a lot of it is already lost. So they were trying to have a baseline so they could see if there was any interventions that could be done down the road. Now, what's really sad, at least one of the students has been killed. Um, They had collaborators on the project, media collaborators. Now, because of some of the restrictions that we talked about earlier, the students didn't have access to things like basic things like GPS mapping or um, drones to capture aerial images. So they had these media collaborators that helped them get the drone footage And two of the media collaborators were unfortunately killed. One of them was a famous photojournalist Mm -hmm. who produced some of the fantastic images that you see associated with this project. And they were having trouble, obviously, finding the students. And they had to also do it very sensitively. They understand, you know, a lot of them were displaced. They had to move from their place of home to somewhere that was safer. So, again, it takes you back to the human aspect of it. But what Georgia, she was quite clear about was, yes, it's it's a little bit uncomfortable talking about archaeology during this time. However, during her experience with the students, she said they were so passionate about their heritage. They were so passionate to learn and record all this data that she felt it was important to talk about it. She felt it was important to talk about these discoveries because she knew how much it meant to them. Absolutely. And also she stressed, did she not, that it's not just local heritage, it's world heritage. That project is all about establishing that information. It is the world's heritage as well as a very particular heritage of those communities local to it. Absolutely. And that's something that every single person associated with Gaza's history, be it Palestinian or otherwise, Palestinians themselves that I spoke to from the ministry, the museum owner, the other people, they all said the same thing. It was repeated over and over. This is our history. This is our heritage, but it's not just ours. So that was a message that was very clear from everyone that I spoke with. I know you've spoken to people at UNESCO. What have they told you? So UNESCO, there's three tentative UNESCO heritage sites in Gaza. It's St. Hilarion that we mentioned is one of them. Antheden Harbour is another one. Antheden Harbour has been reported to have been damaged quite early on. It's thought to be the first seaport of Gaza, which was inhabited from around 800 BC to about 1100 AD. Mm. So it's quite a significant site. And there are reports that's been damaged. And there is another site, it's called the Wadi Gazan Coastal Wetlands. So these three sites are on the UNESCO tentative heritage list. So UNESCO is watching all the heritage sites, as I understand it, but in particular these three. But like most 
they don't have direct access. So what they have said is they're monitoring the situation through satellite imagery, is what they've said, and they are urging everyone to respect international law. Right, and the thing is, I guess, that it is in the Hague Convention. You should not target cultural property, places of worship and so on. The difficulty, and we talked about this in relation to Ukraine too, is proving intention, of course. So it is one thing that property should be damaged, it's another thing for property to be targeted, and that's where it becomes the matter of international law and war crimes and so on. Was there any indication from the agencies that you spoke to that they're talking about war crimes or anything like that? So the Hague Convention has been brought up in several conversations with various people, be it off the record, because it is too early to prove intent, as you mentioned. But it's certainly something that people are clearly looking into or plan to look into once the dare I say, dust settles. Well, Savi, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this story, but thank you for updating us. Thank you. You can read more on this story at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, a big Emily Karma and Ware show in Canberra and a Gauguin manuscript at the Courtauld. That's after this week's news bulletin. The Saarland Museum in Saarbrücken, Germany, has cancelled an exhibition of work by the South African-born, Berlin-based artist Candice Breitz, saying it would not show the art of any artist who does not clearly recognise Hamas' terror as a rupture of civilization. It was not clear from a statement issued by the museum what comments Breitz had made that prompted the decision, which was taken in consultation with Jewish community representatives in the state of Saarland. Breitz, who herself is Jewish, said that she was not consulted about the decision beforehand and still has received no explanation. She said via an email that she has condemned Hamas loudly and unequivocally on a number of occasions, many of which are well documented. The cancellation of the exhibition is the latest in a series of scandals in relation to the Israel-Hamas war in Germany, including the resignation of the finding committee of the major international exhibition documenta, which we covered on last week's podcast. The UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is embroiled in a row over the Parthenon marbles after cancelling a meeting with the Greek Prime Minister scheduled to take place on Tuesday. The Greek Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, told the BBC that during his visit to London, he would continue to lobby for a partnership deal over the controversial 5th century BC statues, which are housed at the British Museum. Mitsotakis declined a secondary offer to meet the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, instead. The Greek PM expressed his annoyance at Sunak's cancellation and added, quote, anyone who believes in the right and justice of his positions is never afraid of confronting arguments. Hundreds of ancient artefacts from Crimea returned to Ukraine on Sunday after spending nearly a decade in the Netherlands at the centre of a court battle following Russia's annexation of the Black Sea Peninsula. Referred to collectively as Scythian gold, the objects were stranded in legal limbo in Amsterdam in 2014 after being taken for display at an exhibition at the Allard Pearson Museum. The Supreme Court of the Netherlands ruled in June 2023 that the items should be returned to Kiev and not to the four Crimean museums from which they come, since they were under Russian control. The Natural History Museum of Ukraine, which received the artefacts on Sunday, said in a statement that it would store them until the deoccupation of Crimea, the ultimate goal of Ukraine's counteroffensive against the Russian invasion. To read these stories and much more, visit the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Lose yourself in art from antiquity to the 21st century this classic week at Christie's London. Escape to 18th century Venice with a pair of evocative scenes of the Grand Canal by Canaletto and immerse yourself in prints by Rembrandt with 75 of his graphic masterpieces from the esteemed collection of Sam Josephowitz. See ancient sculptures and works of art juxtaposed alongside 21st century creations by Damien Hirst, Anthony Gormley and Grayson Perry in the Mujan Museum of Classical Art Sale Part 1 and feast your eyes on a captivating selection of paintings, drawings, watercolours and sculptures spanning six centuries across two old masters auctions. Visit 8 King Street in the heart of London's Mayfair from the 1st to the 7th of December and immerse yourself in a panorama of art and antiquity. Entry is free and open to the public. Visit christies.com to find out more. 
Welcome back. Now, this week it was announced that a major exhibition of the work of the Indigenous Australian artist Emily Karma and Ware will open at Tate Modern in 2025. It will be the first large-scale presentation in Europe of a woman who has become arguably the most celebrated Australian painter of the 20th century. The news was announced at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra as it unveiled its own major show of and Ware's work this week. A senior woman from the Amatia people, and Ware was born around 1914, but it was only in the last two decades before her death in 1996 that she devoted herself to painting. She created works that encapsulate her experience of her country, al which lies 250 kilometres northeast of Alice Springs in the Northern Territory and is adjacent to the more famous indigenous homeland of Utopia. Her response to this environment and its people was reflected first in vibrant batik textiles and later in paintings on canvas, some on a monumental scale. The two curators of the exhibition in Canberra are Kelly Cole and Hetty Perkins, and I spoke to them about this remarkable artist. Hetty and Kelly, I wonder if you begin just by introducing yourselves and your involvement with this project and also your peoples, because I think that's an important texture to this conversation. Yeah, hi, my name is Kelly Cole and I'm a Warramunga Lurija woman from Central Australia and grew up in Alice Springs and co-curator of the Emily Kama Enware exhibition. Likewise, co-curator um, of the Emily Kama Enware exhibition and my name is Hetty Perkins and I'm Arunda and Kalkadun, also from Central Australia. Great. Now, I wanted to begin this discussion by talking a little bit about Emily's biography. One thing I'd really like to get straight to begin with is to what extent was Emily's freedom within her country affected during her lifetime and across her lifetime? To what extent was her country severely compromised by colonial settlers and so on? Well, Nguaro's story is a really important story reflective of 20th century Australia and the experience of Aboriginal people in that past century. So she was born in the bush around 1914 And it wasn't until she was an older, still a girl, by all reports, potentially a teenager, that she saw her first white fella. And you can imagine, well, it's actually difficult to imagine what that must have looked like and felt like to her. And since that time, you know, towards the end of her life, she passed away in 1996. She experienced first the colonial frontier, then the pastoral frontier, and then, you know, the incursion of, I guess, government agencies, you know, the towns established, you know, other communities established. And so that was very much part of her life experience. And um, I think it's something that makes her work speak even more strongly to us because her work is a continuation of the world's oldest cultural tradition and evidence of its tensile strength, you know, like its integrity that really has sustained our people over the past couple of centuries in Australia. And um, certainly, you know, as I said, her work is a really important story for 20th century Australia. One thing that I'm constantly thinking of is that we're actually entering a chapter in Australia's history where we won't have any of our people who remember Australia before whitefellas came. And that's, you know, that's a really important, I think, turning point in this country. And that's why it's really important. I was very excited when Kelly talked to me about working on this exhibition with her. Um, it's been a passion of hers for, for many, many years now. And I felt that shows like this are really important to tell those stories of our people. And Kelly, tell us more about Al Halka country, which is where Emily lived. It's in what's called Northern Territory, but how vast an area is it? And, and how much does it cross over with other countries? And how much does it interrelate to other countries? Yeah, well, the Northern Territory, obviously, by name means that it sits on the north end of Australia and is bordered by three other states. Emily's country is a Lolkra country and it's situated northeast of Alice Springs, which is in the centre of Australia. A Lolkra country itself is Emily's country. It is referred to as an area, but when an Imware paints her paintings, there's a specific site within that Alokra country that she also paints. Right, and it's, it's extraordinarily connected to country isn't it it's written through all the work that effectively this is a very holistic project and she is depicting her land her people the food that is eaten and and so on the the animals that surround it and and it's all interconnected that's crucial right yeah that's right I mean 
Mare actually started with batik, and so in her first early batiks, which she started in 1977, depict, like you said, beautiful drawings or、um, depictions of goannas, emus, myrna, which is all the edible foods on country. And she starts with that, and then she also depicts other amazing and wonderful connected subjects from her cultural knowledge. And Hetty. It's crucial to establish that she had begun painting before the Batik period because painting was a crucial element of the of the body painting, which was part of women's ceremonies in her country. Yes, I think one of the things that obviously very much connects her to this, the you know, as we say, we have a very ancient and enduring cultural tradition in this country, is that there's part of the work, and I think the vitality of the work, and the sort of even the tactility of the work. Particularly in the paintings, as well as in the batiks, very much stems from the gesture of painting on the body,、um, using ochres, you know, for ceremony for awulia. Also, the、um, sand drawings that are part of the cultural practices in communities, you know, throughout Australia, but very much so in Central Australia. And I think the immediacy of the sand drawings and the fact that they can be ephemeral is something that really translates in her work, as well as these kind of very sort of broad gestural marks that appear as if they're made with the fingers or the thumb, you know. So it's got this kind of physical or sort of tactile. You know, there's a muscle. I think that it looks like there's a、right. the muscle that's being used to make these marks is it's like a cultural flex. <laughs> And Kelly, one of the things that's interesting about your show is that the batik works are absolutely central to it in the sense that certainly in terms of how her work is presented in Britain, I'm very aware of the works made in acrylic, and it's often said she started making art. You know, eight years before she died, but the batik works are a really important part of her work, and I, I, you know, there are very many works in your show, right? Yeah, so the, her batik practice is really important. She actually worked in batik for eleven years prior to working on the painting medium. We have several beautiful batiks in the exhibition, which are absolutely extraordinary, and we do a didactics where we start talking about that medium, which is really important. When she started painting, she was a part of a group. Exhibition, which was called a summer project, where there were eighty-one other artists involved in that community project, all of which are women except one male, and we've got this whole a summer project in our exhibition displayed on a huge, big curved wall. And the reason we wanted to make sure that work was included was we wanted to recenter and reposition in what a. Back into her community where she started, and where they all still paint those same extraordinary paintings of their country and everything around. I want to ask about that because obviously she is an exceptional artist, but I wanted to understand how she was established as an exceptional artist, if you like. Because obviously, as you say, there are eighty other artists there, and one of the cruelties of history, if you like, is that we have a massive focus on this exceptional artist. But tell me about that community, and to what extent Emily really did stand out, or to what extent she was fortunate to be singled out. So when we talk about the summer project, Imare was one of the artists, like we said, out of eighty-one, and her painting was selected. It's called Imi Woman. Was selected to be on the cover of the catalogue, and then went on to do all the sort of promotional stuff for that exhibition. When you see this painting, we've got it beside the whole series, but it's sort of singled out to the side. You can actually see Imare. She was such a special, amazing artist. That painting is extraordinary. It warranted being on the cover. I think that one of the other things was she was the most senior artist of the group at that time, and certainly a very enthusiastic and active participant in the batik making as well as in the painting. And I think that was something that distinguished her. But there were other artists around that time who were also distinguished. You know. I guess they found an audience for their work, if you like, because these are often filters or opinions that are applied externally within the community. But I think it's one of those things when the, her community we've embarked on, you know, extensive consultation and discussion with the community in the lead up to this exhibition, and, and really appreciated their advice. And they'll be attending the opening for Ingware. I think it's interesting to think about maybe why. She felt that people loved her work, and the reason what she thought was that it was because she was painting her country. She said in in these archival recordings, she acknowledged that people were 
sort of fighting over her work. You know, they were jealous for her work. Everyone wanted her work. And she said, it's because I'm painting my country. It's because my country is so beautiful. It's so culturally rich and significant. So I think it's interesting to look at the lens, you know, through the eyes of the artist about what she feels is or was the uh, attraction for her work. But it did have on another level resonances with, I think, people that may not be familiar with who she was and where she was from and what informed her work. So when we showed her work at the Venice Biennale in 1997, um, many people were struck by the work and, of course, by her age and her life experience and things like that. You know, obviously all these things, it's a culmination of different elements, isn't it, that come into the frame. And they found resonances with other art movements around the world. I think for her, though, she gets the final word. It was because she was painting her country that people loved her work. That's a really interesting aspect of how her work's been considered, isn't it? Because so often, especially in New York auctions and London auctions and so on, the work's so often framed within the context of a Western lens, if you like. It's considered within the histories of abstraction and so on. Is one of the goals of this exhibition, Kelly, to, in a way, disrupt that kind of reading and and to really return it to its origins and to explore its iconography within the context that the artist herself wanted it to be explored? Yeah, and it's not just about the artist, it's also about the community. Emily never left her community and she always painted with, you know, like Hetty said, her contemporaries who, you know, were with her when the Utopia Arts Centre movement came along. So our goal is, um, and always has been from the beginning of us both doing this exhibition, was to work with the community, have the community's voices really included in this. I mean, because they refer to her as that old lady, they remember her. The stories, like I said, belong to them. The paintings that she painted, it's their country, it's their awulia, which is their, like I said, ceremonial song and dance. And so we wanted to really bring her descendants and the Utopia community along with us to be with this exhibition. And um, we've done that, like Hetty mentioned before, that we will have 17 of the women from the Utopia community not only come to the exhibition, but they will also dance, they'll paint up. And so they'll have those beautiful body paints on their chest, their breasts and their arms. And again, leading back to the fact that Enwaro, as a senior woman, she painted up some of these extraordinary women who were coming and all the grandparents of some of these women that are coming from the um, community. Let's talk about the iconography of the paintings then, Hetty, because there is so much focus on trying to unravel it in a way also with a kind of Western lens. Can they be unraveled in a simple way or is it actually just an incredibly complex network, if you like, of references? It is relatively complex, but it's also relatively straightforward, (laughs) which is part of its beautiful complexity. I think um, we were, when uh, Kelly and I have been talking about this and, you know, when you look at, for instance, the batiks, as Kelly mentions, a lot of the iconography appears in those early batiks and it's, I think, as her dear friend, the linguist Jenny Green said, you know, her personality was to tackle these new opportunities with enthusiasm and, and you can really see in some of those batik works, it's a new medium, it's a new way of sharing her story and her culture so she's really pouring everything into it and when you look at those works and look at them closely you can see that those elements of those works then appear you know they appear and they take centre stage in later they're like stories in a book sub stories and then they have their own moment to shine and we do sort of unpack the work and the iconography within the exhibition look at the particular references to karma the seed and seed pod after which she was named which is part of the pencil yam the inurula and the vine structure, the growth, the leaves, you know, the the tubers under the ground. But also I think what's interesting is so we can look at it and we can say, yes, that's a norula, you know, this is the vines and so on. In the way that the plant is, you know, so is Imwari's work. There's an above ground level and there's a subterranean level. And so we can look at those things and we can appreciate them. We can look at body paint designs and we can sort of make those connections. But I think, you know, what her work is really about is for us and what really compels audiences even if they're not sure what that magnetic attraction is the culture that she's drawing from she somehow manages to sort of be a conduit for that incredible cultural reservoir that she tapped into as a senior and much at a woman and that that power and that energy I think is what appears on the canvas is what animates the work you know it makes it stop being like minimalism when she's painting lines and becomes this kind of very sophisticated yet very energetic and raw cultural expression Absolutely. And one thing I wanted to explore, Kelly, is the scale, because I noticed in the catalogue that the very earliest batik work is vast. And it's I mean, she went on to make much more vast works, but right from the start, the scale is 
you know, over a metre and, and then it just gets bigger and bigger in some ways. Yeah, look, I guess her batiks vary in size. So she has works on cotton and on silk. Within our exhibition, we've got the earliest work ever in a collection, which she did in 1977, which is a very small cotton. It's a really important work, that one, because we talk about the fact that Amaro, when she first learned to do batik, it was a part of a women's sort of craft and educational workshops. And so they introduced tie dyeing and batik. But this batik itself looks like how, when she also got taught how to write and it's script on a, a page. And when you look at this beautiful batik, it's got this linear stuff. It's almost like writing on a page. And we write about that in the um, catalogue. It's a really extraordinary work. So it sort of starts off with those beautiful batiks. And then we go on to, you know, this early batik from 77. And then we've got ones that are 10 metres in scale, which are hung to the ceiling of the National Gallery, you know, draped over two lengths. So you can see both sides of it. You can see the inner side of the um, batik. And then when you look at her paintings, we start off with these very intimate ones of figurative work of a woolia with the women's breasts and the arms like we talk about. And then we sort of, I won't say where it sits within our exhibition, but we have a 10 metre large uh, anula, which is yam painting, which is just beautiful, black and white, amazing painting. So scale goes all the way through, very small and intimate to extremely large ones of country, a lolkra as well. And they're dazzling, aren't they? I mean, she's probably best known, I guess, certainly in the UK for paintings using dots, using these circular forms. But the linear works, like the big yam dreaming, there is this sort of extraordinary language that she has. You can see her pushing and pushing in the paintings, really stretching herself, Hetty. Yeah, I think one of the things that's been a revelation for us and is very important to this exhibition is in consulting with the community, their sort of views on the works and what the works are about and... You know, for instance, the National Gallery of Australia has a very uh, large multi-panel work called the Alaltra Suite, you know, and when the artists were looking at images of, I think it's got 22 panels in all, when the community members who are also artists were looking at this work, you know, they were saying, oh, yes, she's painted all the colours, all the seasons of that country, you know, that's Alaltra, she's painted the rocks, she's painted the waterways, you know, the grasslands, the spinifex plains, you know, they're reading the work in that way. And I think that that's something that we're trying to bring to this mm. exhibition to sort of say, well, in this, the colours, you know, people might call them traditional Aboriginal colours, you know, reds and ochres and yellows and browns. But as the community pointed out, those colours are really indicators of age. So, for instance, if she's painting an emu story, which was one of her very, you know, important themes of her work, as Kelly said, her first painting was entitled Emu Woman, there's lots of whites and greys. That means she's talking about older emus. You know, so, yeah, it's really interesting to have not those kind of visual indicators that are understood by community, if you like, who are literate in the interpretation of their own culture, you know, through Inwari's works. It's something that for us has been amazing to be able to work with the family to bring those stories to light too in this exhibition. You know, Hetty and I have been working on this exhibition for over two years now, but the last 18 months we've really have spent time consulting with community and I keep saying that consultation is not just about giving and receiving I mean it goes deeper than that it's about relationships it's about earning trust and stuff like that and so for the wonderful women who have welcomed us onto that community working with the Utopia Arts Centre and Sophia Lund the manager has been really a wonderful experience we went out and did a women's camp while we were in Utopia in March of this year it was a typical central desert sort of uh, four day where the heat was over 47 degrees, trying to hide under wow. little trees. Yeah. The women took it to a beautiful waterhole and so that's a part of the catalogue and, you know, it's really um, extraordinary. The only other thing I would love to say is too, when we talk about her name, Emily Kama Emware, Emily, you talked about, you know, colonisation and what was it like for her to grow up. Emily wasn't given to her until later in life by, you know, a station owner or something. Inware is a skin name, a classification name. There are eight skin groups and Inware is one of them. And Karma, which is how the women uh, refer to her, is, again, the name that was given to her from her parents. And Karma means that seed which she paints. That's really interesting. I wanted to explore the reception of her work. Hetty, you worked on the Venice Biennale show in 1997. And that was an extraordinary moment. There's also, obviously, as you said, there was an extraordinary clamour 
for her work, including a market clamour. And she produced 3,000 works in, in eight years on canvas. Is that right? So tell us about that demand. And also, to what extent did that affect her? She was an elderly woman when she was making these works. To produce that vast body of work, were there pressures she was under to produce work as well as a kind of compulsion from herself to produce them? Yes, I think that it's fair to say there was pressures, you know, placed on her to produce work. And what we're sort of looking at is her own compulsion to also tell her story. And that's what, as Kelly was talking about, how the scale increased. You know, it was to a certain scale from the get-go, really, you know, to have the energy, particularly as an older woman, to create these vast canvases. But by all reports, you know, they were completed relatively quickly, you know, and that's one of the things that we drew from when looking at her work for the Venice Biennale, which showed alongside the works of Judy Watson and uh, Yvonne Kulmatri, was this idea of fluency, you know, that sort of fluency of expression of indeed Ingwari's mark making being like a language that we could all understand. And so I think she was, you know, subjected to intense pressures as anyone that sort of achieves a level of fame and celebrity that she did is subjected to. But I think it was also something, it seems to me, that she was very motivated to tell her story, you know, and to, like, write her story, you know. She obviously knew she was elderly. She really enjoyed the challenges of working in new mediums, new materials. She was supporting her family. And so I think that's something to really sort of take note of, that this was a, you know, a woman who had a very strong personality. Jenny Green, who knew her well, says that, you know, her work reflects her personality and one thing that again has struck us with the community talking to the community about her work is that they said you know her paintings are telling the truth and I think that's something that has potentially not really been sort of captured in in any way you know this idea that these paintings that are very what people might describe as quite abstracted are in fact you know laying down truths and bringing that to the world I think is a very important concept and certainly something I think that would have very strongly compelled her you know she said I am calm I paint the karma you know this is my name that's what I paint you know so all the archival recordings that we have to support this exhibition really point to a very sort of direct and focus engagement with the public appreciation of her work. I love to add to that too, with Hetty, with working with the women, the women said that Mwari always had more than one canvas on the go, depending on the side, but she had rolls of canvas that she would produce. She loved painting. She would paint in the desert where she lived. There was no electricity and she would paint from sun up to sundown. And we've got wonderful photos in our catalogue again, where there's rolls of painting that are stuck within the trees while she's got other paintings on the ground. And there's beautiful pictures that we have of her with her family and other contemporary artists that she worked with. And I think it's sort of also, you know, when we were talking earlier just now about the sand drawings, you know, and the fact that they're kind of ephemeral. You make these marks, you tell these stories, and then you wipe the surface of the sand and you start over, you tell a different story. And people talk about her painting, creating work, and then just finishing it. Or, you know, coming into a space, seeing a canvas that wasn't for her, and then asking for it, making a painting on it, and then done and, you know, moving on to the next one. And I think, it, it, to my mind, it really does echo that practice of sand painting, you know, that... It's the writing of the story that is the important part. It's the action of telling the story is as important as the resulting story itself. Yeah, because that's a beautiful analogy because if you can imagine you're doing all these sand drawings and then you wipe it away and you start again. Mm. It's like she's doing her paintings on a painting and then she rolls it up and starts another one. It's Mm. a different sort of sand drawing, a different story, or it could be a continuation of the story that she has just painted. Because repetition is a very big part of... Awulia and cultural life, this idea of singing, you know, verses of, of songs. I mean, when you see people, we have the privilege of seeing people performing, you know, Awulia in song and dance, you know, there there's this sort of iteration of actions or verses or words that are quite mesmerising, you know, the articulation of that. And it's a way of absorbing knowledge. It's an immersive way of learning. And I think that that's something that, again, Ingwari is sort of channeling, you know, in the the creation of those works. It's the fluidity that comes from being able to channel something that gives you that energy, that gives you that passion and that sort of power. And and that is evident in the final product to us. But for the artist, I think it's the act of making the work is as important as the final finished work. Lastly, I just wanted to reflect on the timing again. Hetty, you mentioned that it's a really important show coming now in terms of the history of Emily's people and so on it's impossible to ignore the fact that there was the voice referendum earlier this year and this is this major show is timed when it is 
What do you feel this exhibition can say in terms of that debate? Because it seems to me it's, it's crucial that it arrives now and that people can see this extraordinary exhibition at this moment. Yeah, I think it is a very timely exhibition. Obviously, it wasn't in, planned that way, but every exhibition that we do as Aboriginal people, Aboriginal curators and working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists in this country is political. It doesn't really matter when it is, but of course, having just had the referendum in Australia, which was resoundingly rejected for our people to have a voice, it does feel somewhat ironic to be presenting one of the most powerful reasons that we have in the history of this country for us as Aboriginal people to have a voice to Parliament, which is our culture. And that is something that is known throughout the world. It's the oldest tradition in the world. And I think that it shows that we do have a long way to go in this country, you know, that the hard work over decades of Ingwari and others of our ancestors and, and people today, what we've achieved and the fight that we still have to go. So, of course, in, in her lifetime, Ingwari, we talked about experiencing the frontier and the land being taken away and people having to negotiate with all sorts of new rules and regulations and deprivations and terrible things that happened to them. Then to see the Land Rights Act come in in the mid-70s, of course, this is when the, you know, the literacy, numeracy and some of these adult workshops and things are starting. And I think that was an era of real positivity. You know, they felt like there's some change and making some momentum and recognition is coming. Well, it's disappointing that our art and our stories are celebrated, but yet as Aboriginal people, we are not respected and regarded, so that we don't, you know, have a voice. And indeed, I think it's one of the things that the results show that overwhelmingly Aboriginal people voted yes for this voice. So we were just let down by the majority of other Australians. Well, Kelly and Hetty, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Lovely to speak with you. Thank you so much. Emily Karma and Ware is at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra from the 2nd of December until the 28th of April 2024. And as I say, the Tate Modern version of the show is in 2025. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. It's just been announced that the Courtauld in London has acquired from auction a manuscript written by Paul Gauguin just a few months before he died in the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. The 28-page text was intended for an art magazine and sent by Gauguin to André Fontaine, the Belgian symbolist, in September 1902 and expressed, as Gauguin put it in a covering letter, a deep conviction which I'm anxious to make known. It was not published and Gauguin died a few months later. I spoke to Martin Bailey, our London correspondent, who's a specialist in Vincent van Gogh and Gauguin, about the Courtauld's latest acquisition. Martin, can we begin by establishing, first of all, where Gauguin was geographically, but also where he was in terms of his career, his artistic reputation at that time? Yes. Well, the manuscript that we got dates from 1902, which was the year before Gauguin died. At that time, he'd already moved to Tahiti, to the main island, but he then wanted somewhere that was less civilised, as he would put it, and he moved to the Marquesan Islands, which are a thousand kilometres north of Tahiti. So it was very, very remote where he was living, and he was sort of cut off from the rest of the world, essentially, except for letters which he would send to his friends in Paris and he would get news from Paris occasionally but that took months to arrive and at that time he was quite a controversial figure avant-garde critics liked him and some people were buying his art but in general it was seen as ludicrous the colours were bizarre the subject matter was unexpected and exotic to a French audience so he was sort of fighting to establish his career. And remember, he was not in good health and he knew he was not going to live all that long. So I think this was the moment where he wanted to sort of put some of his thoughts on the record. And it was intended as an article to be published, is that right? It was, yes. It was intended to be published in the Mercure de France, which was a monthly journal at that time, an avant-garde journal, very well respected in uh, those sort of progressive circles but it was never published. They didn't like it. It's 28 pages long, but what sort of size pages are we talking? I mean, I saw the document yesterday because it had just arrived in Paris this week. It's roughly a full size. 
it's quite a moment to actually see the document and to sort of hold it, even if not in the physical sense. The paper's gone brown, some of the ink is slightly faded, but you get a real sense of immediacy seeing the actual thing. Now let's establish what it's called, because it's given a title which is somewhat obscure, isn't it? It's very difficult. The the French title was Racontar de Rapin. Now, it's extremely difficult to translate that into English. Racontar is probably best translated as tales or stories or some people said gossip, um, (laughs) something along those lines. So uh, let's call it tales. The word rapa is very difficult or impossible to translate. It's not used today or hardly used today. Centuries ago, it was used to describe an artist's apprentice or an amateur artist. And then around 1900, it developed another sense, and it was used to describe one of the progressive artists who worked in Montmartre, which, of course, is the sort of artist that Gauguin was. So it can mean these two things. Now, what did Gauguin actually mean? He loved ambiguity in everything, and I suspect he wanted French readers to read it in both senses as an amateur artist and as an accomplished avant-garde artist. Right, I mean, it sort of feeds into the sort of self-mythology, if you like, that Gauguin was generating around what he was doing. Yes, yes, he was very much aware of his image and he liked to be controversial, Uh, he liked to be witty. Now tell us about the content. What does the letter or the article say? Well, it is quite a sort of rambling document. I mean, the basic point, if one was to put it in a few words is that Gauguin is criticising art critics who, he say, don't know anything about art. He says what they do know about art is the art of the past and what he is interested in is the art of the present and the future. So it's a diatribe against critics. Uh, I'm sorry to say this to you, Ben, because of course you are one, um, but there we are. (laughs) Well, it it was ever thus. And indeed, maybe critics are too based in the past, but um, that's another matter. But it's really interesting that he is obviously thinking about the wider art world when he's making these criticisms. And so, for instance, he talks about Impressionism both positively and negatively. What does he say? Yes, I mean, the, the section where he talks about Impressionism is particularly interesting. I mean, he welcomes the movement. And remember, it was sort of developed in the 1870s so it was nearly 30 years earlier when it started but it was still going strong or strong in Paris anyway and he says it's a good movement but he does say that it's become too much of an established movement too much of a school Mm. and that people should move on I mean it's also interesting the individual artists who he names explicitly um, including some of the impressionists uh, he describes Renoir as a good draftsman He's particularly positive about Pissarro and the way Pissarro tackled landscapes. And there's a lovely passage when he says that Pissarro was painting a wheat stack. He would go to the wheat stack and walk round it and really sort of take it in. And he then lists about 40 named artists who he likes, but he doesn't say anything particularly about them. Right. And curiously, Van Gogh is mentioned in this long list, but nothing more is said about Van Gogh, despite the fact that Gauguin and Van Gogh, of course, lived together in Arles in the Yellow House for a few months in 1888. Indeed. Let's talk about the fact that he mentions Burne Jones. I think this is a really important thing because actually one of the things that's lost about Burne Jones to a certain degree, this now relatively underappreciated, I'd say, British artist, is that he did have quite an impact on the continent and Gauguin reflects that by mentioning. Yes, I mean, I was most surprised to see Burne Jones's name mentioned and he said a few words about Burne Jones. Uh, He said Burne Jones was sad and a melancholic. I don't know whether he'd taken that from the paintings or whether he'd read some article, but I thought that was interesting. He also mentions Whistler, which again is interesting. I mean, Whistler was a truly cosmopolitan figure, but it's still interesting that Goga, when he was in Polynesia, would sort of single him out. Right. And then there's this section which you have pulled out in your article which is really indicative I think of Gauguin's attitudes it's a kind of almost a fantasy or a dreamlike scene that he describes but it says so much about Gauguin's experience in that part of the world and his attitudes to the people he was encountering there. Yes it's the most bizarre incident and I'm not quite sure how we should interpret it. Gauguin says that he was sitting on a rock not very far from the sea just after sunset at twilight he was smoking And he then said, 
out of the bush, he gradually saw a figure emerge that came nearer to him. It was a thin person who got tattoos over their body and they were naked. And he said they looked a bit like a toad. Yeah. Um, the figure approached him and he realised it was a woman. And the woman, first of all, touched his face. Then the woman touched his member. Yeah. Uh, it's a most bizarre story, but he felt it was very important. And the reason why I'm actually recounting this story, it's not just sensationalism. Gauguin said that it influenced his art for the coming weeks. So therefore, I think it's very germane. And the story should be told. And we should see some of the pictures at that time in the light of that. So in a way, it's typical of Gauguin. It's obviously a fantasy, but he mixes fact and fantasy together. Absolutely. And that's Gauguin. Yeah, that very much is Gauguin. And I think, of course, reading it, it's deeply problematic in, in all sorts of ways. Yes. And we, we, we know about that idea of him, as many scholars have pointed out, that he's sort of what might today be called sex tourism, him yeah. going over there to seek erotic pleasure. And then also this attitude of, because he mentions it, savagery and barbarism. Yeah. So in terms of the sort of colonialist kind of attitudes that were endemic in that time, you really feel that in this passage, don't you? Yes. I mean, I don't think one should necessarily see that incident that he describes as reflecting what he actually did in real life. Right. Because it's a fantasy. And it's easy to forget that Gauguin was a person of his time and his attitudes were very much typical of French period at that time. And my personal feeling is there's a danger of us looking at Gauguin through 2023 20, eyes. So let's talk about the fact that the court hold has acquired this manuscript then, because it seems to me really important in terms of its content in relation to the court old's own collection because it has works which are very related in terms of the kind of themes and the kind of execution to the words that he's using in the descriptions that he's making. Yes, I mean, perhaps I should just begin by explaining how they acquired it. It was bought at auction at Christie's in Paris last month and it was acquired for €65,000 and fortunately the court hall was able to buy it. And the reason why they bought it is that they acquired another very important Gauguin manuscript in 2020, avant et après, or before and after, and that's an even longer and more important manuscript. And the one they bought now is the last Gauguin manuscript in private hands. So the Courtauld is now in the unusual position of having two. So I think they see themselves as becoming a little bit of a study centre for Gauguin, which is very nice. They have very important paintings. They have two really big and great Tahitian paintings, including Nevermore, and one earlier Gauguin painting from Brittany. So they've got quite a good Gauguin collection, probably the best in the UK. And this is really the icing on the cake. Absolutely. Let's talk about how they can use it, because it, is it just a research object? Will they be able to display it? You've seen the thing. How fragile is it? Is it the sort of thing that could be put in a display case and shown in the galleries? Well, the conservator hasn't actually yet examined it because it had only just arrived a few hours before I saw it. It looks quite fragile. The paper is quite sort of sensitive and prone to problems if it's touched. So I'm afraid it's not the sort of thing which is easily going to be handed around and shown to researchers. And the initial idea is to get very high quality images of it and to put them online early next year and to publish a fully accurate transcript and the best English translation of the document and then for it to be able to be studied. I imagine that occasionally it could be displayed with the other Gauguin manuscript, but only for short periods because damage from light could lead to gradual fading. And that's particularly important when it comes to manuscripts, isn't it? Because the inks that people write with are even more fragile often than the inks that are used to paint with or, yes, or, 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 exactly. or indeed, especially oils or, exactly. or whatever. Gauguin obviously wrote it expecting it to be published. He didn't expect the original manuscript to be survived and to be looked at uh, more than a century later. So it's written on ordinary paper with very ordinary ink. How do you feel that the emergence of this manuscript will help advance Gauguin studies, if you like? How significant a document is it in that sense? 
Well, it adds to what we've got. I mean, Gauguin is such an enigmatic person that all the sort of bits that you can put together are good. Now, it's already been published in French and in an English publication as well. But now we have the original. There may be a few words that one might read differently. The other thing is that publicity about the acquisition and the fact that it's available and may be displayed occasionally will add to the status of the document and I think will be taken more seriously by Gauguin scholars. And the fact it's got a title which you can't actually translate into English has meant that I think this document has been rather ignored in the Gauguin world. So hopefully its emergence into a public collection after it's been hidden away in private collections ever since it was made is a good thing. Well, Martin, thank you very much for telling us about it. Thank you. You can read more on this story on the website or the app. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Sarvi, Kelly, and Hetty, and Martin. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.